The secret book according to John, or Apocryphon of John, is the most important Gnostic writing that survives today. We know it's Gnostic because a major part of it matches what Irenaeus tells us the Gnostics taught. It's important because it tells the entire Gnostic myth, starting with God and the creation of this world, and ending with the coming of the Savior and the salvation of humanity. It seems to have been very influential in the ancient world because four copies of it survive, all Coptic translations of the original Greek. And these four copies show that the secret book was revised and updated more than once, even as its basic myth remained the same. But the importance of the secret book according to John goes even beyond this. We know that it comes from the middle of the second century because Irenaeus knew its myth around the year 180. Unfortunately, we have no idea who the author was. The book claims to describe a revelation from God to the Apostle John, but scholars don't believe this. Instead, they think that the book was written sometime between 100 and 150. This means that the secret book is the oldest surviving Christian work of any kind, that gives a complete and comprehensive narrative of salvation. It's the earliest grand vision of Christianity that we know of. Because of the length and importance of this work, I'm going to talk about it in this lecture and the following one. First, I'll explore the conception of God we see in this Gnostic book. According to the Gnostics, God is a complex intellect consisting of numerous aspects or dimensions called eons. The true God may be complicated, but he is perfect and serene. Not so the God who created this world. He is imperfect and angry. The God who created this world is something of a mistake. And so our universe is tragically flawed. That's why we need salvation from the true God. The secret book according to John presents itself as a revelation from the Savior to the disciple and apostle John. When the text opens, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus have already happened, and the disciple John is on his way to the temple in Jerusalem when he meets a Pharisee. The Pharisees were an important group of teachers in first century Judaism. They appear often in the Gospels as opponents of Jesus. So it's no surprise to find a Pharisee criticizing Jesus in the secret book. The Pharisee tells John that Jesus has misled him and turned him away from the true traditions of his ancestors, the Jews. His encounter with the Pharisee upsets John, who begins to ask questions. Who was Jesus really? Who is his father? What's the place where Jesus has gone and where his followers will go? And so on. It's then that the heavens open, a light begins to shine, and the Savior appears to John. The Savior strangely takes three forms, as a child, a young person, and an elderly person. And these three forms morph from one to another. So there's only one Savior, but he appears in three ways. The Savior then begins a long speech to John, which takes up the remainder of the book. Only a few times does John interrupt the Savior and ask questions. When the Savior finishes his long revelation, he instructs John to write down what he told him and keep it safe. He curses anyone who tries to sell this revealed knowledge, whether for money, food, or anything else. The Savior then disappears, and John goes off to tell his disciples what the Savior had revealed to him. The secret book, then, is an apocalypse, a revelation from a divine figure to a human being. Jews and Christians wrote many such revelations in the centuries before and after Jesus. Some of these ended up in the Bible. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament is a good example, and the revelation to John in the New Testament as well. Others did not end up in the Bible, such as the multiple books of Enoch, or the revelations of Adam and Paul, and, of course, our secret book, according to John. 
These revelations are not all the same in their literary structure, but they were all an important way for people to communicate new religious insights. Some of them probably originated in visionary experiences that the authors had. All of the authors surely believed that through study and contemplation, they had gained some new information from God. They wrote this new information in a revelation from God to an authoritative human figure from the past, such as the prophet Daniel, or Moses, or, as in our case, the apostle John. And often, the divine revealer tells the human being to keep the revelation secret until the proper time. This explains why, say, Moses or Enoch received this revelation many, many years ago, but we're only reading it now. And we're usually reading it now because these revelations explain things that are happening now and what's going to happen in the future. They often say that the world we know is going to come to an end soon and will be replaced by a new kingdom of God. That's the message of Daniel in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation in the New Testament. This was good news to Jews and later Christians who lived in a world ruled by the pagan Romans and, they believe, ultimately ruled by the devil. These divine revelations gave them the good news that the present world order of injustice and sin would soon be replaced by a new kingdom of justice and righteousness. And that's the message of the secret book according to John as well. Like these other revelations, it portrays the current world order as dominated by evil rulers who oppress human beings and work to prevent them from achieving their full spiritual potential. But it offers the hope that through the Savior who came in Jesus, God will soon overthrow these rulers and bring his people to salvation. In this respect, the secret book is traditional and similar to other Jewish and Christian works of its time. It brings revelation from God of truths that people didn't know, but which will bring them hope and salvation. But the secret book, according to John, is also very different from other Jewish and Christian revelations. Most of these other books, like Revelation in the New Testament, concentrate on the future, what has not yet happened, and they give their message in highly symbolic visions that are hard to understand. According to the author of Revelation, people will find hope and salvation when they understand God's plan for the future and how it's starting to come true now. Throughout the ages, therefore, people have tried to figure out what the visions in Revelation mean and how they apply to present and future events. In contrast, the Savior's revelation to John in the secret book may be complicated, but it's not symbolic. And it focuses less on the future and more on the past. It goes over in close detail the story of the creation of humanity and the Garden of Eden in Genesis. And it devotes a great deal of attention simply to describing God and how the creator of this world came to be. According to this Gnostic author, people can find hope and salvation not by knowing what's going to happen in the future, but by understanding better who God is and how the world we live in came to be. If you want to know God, be a better person, and find salvation, the secret book says, you need to understand that you came from a God higher than the one you now know, and that the world in which we live is not how it should be. So who is this God that we came from, according to the secret book? The best way to think about the Gnostic God is to think about him as a vast intellect, a mind, similar to but much greater and more well intellectual than our own minds. And so just as our intellects are complex, full of thoughts, and constantly active and creative, so too God is complex, full of thoughts called eons, and constantly active and creative. And just as we find peace when our mind is still and quiet, so too God is perfectly still and quiet, even as he is active and creative. And even more, we can never fully know another person's intellect. No matter how much I love and become familiar with another person, there will always be part of this person's mind that I cannot know. You could say that I can never fully know even my own intellect. 
In the same way, God is ultimately unknowable to human beings. There is a part of God, or better, the very heart of God. It's unknowable beyond our capacity to understand. And that's where the revelation of the Savior to John begins, with God's ultimate unknowability. He calls this ultimate unknowable God the invisible spirit, or sometimes the invisible virgin spirit. The invisible spirit really cannot be talked about at all, and yet the Savior says a lot about it. It's completely one, but otherwise it transcends anything we can say. It's unlimited, unfathomable, ineffable, immeasurable, incorruptible. It really even shouldn't be called divine because it's beyond our concepts of divinity. It's complete silence and complete rest. Now, I've been using the neuter pronoun it to refer to the invisible spirit. And that's right, because the invisible spirit is certainly beyond any idea of gender. It's neither male nor female. But the Gnostics can also refer to the invisible spirit as a father, and perhaps less specifically as a parent. We'll see that at certain points, the invisible spirit acts in ways that seem typical of a male being. So I'll keep referring to the invisible spirit as it, but the Gnostics were not completely gender neutral in their thinking about it. If the invisible spirit were all there is to God, we would never know God. In fact, we would not exist at all because the invisible spirit would just be eternally at rest. But again, God's like an intellect. And so the invisible spirit thinks. And its thinking produces something, a thought. Indeed, a first thought, a thought that comes before every other thought. The invisible spirit's first thought is forethought, the thought that precedes all other thoughts. Forethought is the image of the invisible spirit, because what did the invisible spirit have to think about except itself? So forethought is the invisible spirit, just once removed or slightly less, the invisible spirit's thought about itself. Now, the ancient Greek word that I'm translating as forethought is pronoia. In some translations of Gnostic and Valentinian texts, you'll find words like pronoia left in Greek when they are working as proper names. So this first eon is called pronoia in many translations. But my policy is to translate such Greek terms into English when there's an English equivalent. And so I'll call pronoia by its English name, forethought. Forethought is the first eon that comes forth from the invisible spirit. And it's the highest level of God that we can possibly hope to know. The Gnostics believed that human beings, like God's thoughts, ultimately come from forethought and will return to forethought. In this life, we'll see later, human beings may experience fleeting moments in which they gain gnosis or knowledge of forethought. That's what this myth is ultimately really about, how we can gain gnosis of God through forethought. The name of this eon, forethought, makes sense because it communicates well the status of this eon as the thought that comes before all other thoughts. But the secret book gives forethought another name as well, Barbalo, which has no equivalent in English. The Barbalo eon is one of the most distinctive features of Gnostic myth. When you see the Barbalo in an ancient text, you are almost certainly dealing with Gnostics. Believe it or not, scholars don't know where this name comes from. Historians have proposed various theories, but none has persuaded most people. For now, at least, this will remain one of the mysteries of the Gnostics. Now that we have two aspects of God, the invisible spirit and forethought, or the barbelo, we can start to think of God not only as a person, but something like a place or a realm or space populated by God's thoughts, the eons. When the Gnostics think of God as a collection of eons or eternal beings, they call God the entirety. That is, the total of all spiritual reality, which is God. And once God gets thinking and produces forethought, you can bet that lots of other thoughts are going to emerge. And they do. 
The barbello is called the womb of the entirety because, as God's forethought, the barbello begins the multiplication of God's thoughts. In mythical terms, the barbello requests from the invisible spirit to be given eternal realms, and in response, four new eons appear. Prior acquaintance, incorruptibility, eternal life, and truth. These eons may be considered the most basic aspects of God, God's most original and central thoughts. From one perspective, they are distinct from forethought, the barbello, and so we now have five eons. But from another perspective, they are the same as forethought, contained within forethought, so that the barbello is itself a quintet or set of five eons. And from yet another perspective, there are now ten eons, because we learn that each eon exists in a pair. The Gnostics think of the entirety as stable and serene because each eon has another eon that completes it. They compare this pairing of eons to the complementary natures of male and female in humanity. And so they imagine these eons in male-female pairs that express the unity of two aspects of the same reality. Which eon in a pair is male and which is female is determined by the gender of the eon's name in the Greek language. So, for example, the Greek word for prior acquaintance is pronosis, which is a feminine noun, and so it's considered female. Its consort is intellect, which in Greek is nous, a masculine noun, and so intellect is male. This male-female distinction will become important in a few moments. So now we have a godhead, or an entirety, made up of ten eons, which are somehow also five, and somehow also just one. If this seems complicated, that's because it is. Again, consider your own mind and how you think. Your intellect is full of different thoughts, and yet your mind is still one. Sometimes you might say to someone, my thoughts about this are complicated. And indeed they are. And thus, so is God, in whose image your intellect exists. Now at this point, the invisible spirit gazes at the barbello, and this gaze begets in the barbello a luminous spark, which becomes a new eon called the divine self-originate, in Greek, autogenes, who is also called the anointed one, or Christ. The self-originate, or Christ, comes into being in a way different from the other eons. While eons like eternal life and truth simply appeared when the Barbelo requested them, the self-originate comes into being from an act that looks something like sexual intercourse, as the invisible spirit gazes at the Barbelo and begets the self-originate from the Barbelo. So, the Gnostics think of the invisible spirit, the Barbelo, and the self-originate as something like a nuclear family, as father, mother, and son. This trinity, so to speak, lies at the heart of the Gnostic idea of God. This may explain why the Savior takes three forms when he appears to John. Just as the appearance of the Barbelo resulted in the emanation of ten eons, so too the begetting of the self-originate, or Christ, results in the emanation of twelve more eons. These eons exist in four groups of three. These four groups are led by four beings called the luminaries. The names of the luminaries are, like that of the Barbelo, obscure. They are Harmozael, Oroyael, Dawithai, and Eleleth. These four luminaries are said to stand before or to attend the self-originate. They are, we might say, the self-originate's entourage. The self-originate and his four attendant luminaries with their distinctive names are another important feature of Gnostic myth. When you see these characters in a text, you're almost certainly reading a work of the Gnostics. The four luminaries together provide the basic organization for this part of the entirety. There are two aspects to this. First, as we have seen, 
They're in charge of four sets of three eons, making a total of 12. These 12 eons have abstract names that indicate aspects of God, such as word, perception, intelligence, and peace. The last eon named is wisdom, Sophia. Wisdom will have an important role to play in the myth. Second, the four luminaries also contain within them divine archetypes or patterns of significant human beings or groups of human beings. The four divine archetypes are Adam, his son Seth, the posterity of Seth, and then repentant human beings. We'll learn in our next lecture why these particular human beings and groups are important. But here we might wonder why there are divine archetypes or patterns of human beings within God at all. The answer is in Genesis, where God is said to create human beings in our image. Genesis says that human beings were created in God's image. What does that mean? Jews and Christians have answered this question in different ways throughout the ages. For the Gnostics, it meant that archetypes or patterns of human beings exist eternally within God, settled in the four luminaries. We now have the Gnostic picture of God completely laid out. God consists of a multiplicity of thoughts or eons organized around the central trinity of the invisible spirit, the Barbalo, and the self-originate, or Christ, along with the four luminaries. As complicated as the Gnostic God is, the entirety has unity and stability because all the eons are aspects of the invisible spirit and because all the eons exist in harmonious male-female pairs. So how does our world relate to this spiritual realm of the entirety? Where did our world and we ourselves come from? Our world came into being when the harmony and stability of the entirety were disturbed. What happened was, wisdom, the lowest eon, the eon farthest from the invisible spirit, so to speak, desired to think her own thought, apart from the will of the invisible spirit and without the consent of her consort. Wisdom's considered female because her Greek name, Sophia, is a feminine noun. The female wisdom wanted to think a thought without the cooperation of her male consort. Now, on the one hand, wisdom is an eon of God, and so she possesses divine power. This means that her thinking had to be productive. It would produce another divine being. On the other hand, because wisdom acted on her own without her consort, the divine being she produced was imperfect, ugly, misshapen. Amazingly, therefore, the divine intellect made a mistake, and a bad thought was produced, an error. Wisdom was mortified and embarrassed by what she had done, and so she cast her ugly thought outside the entirety so that the other divine beings would not see it. She called her mistaken, ugly divine being Yaldabaoth. The name Yaldabaoth probably comes from Aramaic and means something like begetter of armies. We'll see that Yaldabaoth creates for himself a multitude of angels or heavenly rulers. Yaldabaoth has other names as well, most importantly, Sacklus. It's Yaldabaoth who is the god of the book of Genesis. And Yaldabaoth is the god who created the universe in which we live. Outside the realm of the entirety was formless matter, and Yaldabaoth used that to make this universe. Yaldabaoth could do this because when his mother, Wisdom, cast him out of the entirety, he took with him the great power of the entirety. Because Yaldabaoth had this divine power and had come from the entirety, he had a dim memory of what the spiritual world is like. He formed this universe as a kind of replica of the spiritual world. So, for example, he made himself a bunch of fellow rulers, just as the invisible spirit has his eons. This universe is not a very good copy of the spiritual world, however, because, of course, Yaldabaoth is not a perfect divine being, but a spiritual error, a mistake. His ignorance and the imperfection of matter mean that the universe in which we live is like the spiritual world, but it's flawed and full of corruption and decay. Yaldabaoth, however, was quite impressed with what he had done, 
Looking at his creation and all his assisting rulers, he proclaimed, I am a jealous God. There is no other God apart from me. This arrogant and clearly mistaken statement combines things that the God of Israel says in the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy and Isaiah. Yaldabaoth's delusion disturbed his mother wisdom. She realized that, she had taken, that he had taken power from her and that he now ignorantly believed that he was himself the ultimate God. Wisdom began to move about in her distress, disturbing the rest and harmony of the entirety. In the next lecture, we'll see how human beings get created and what wisdom does to correct her error and make up for the lack of power that she has caused. But let's first stop here and ask about the origins of these ideas. The Gnostics believed that the ultimate God was remote and could not be fully known, that we can know and understand only lower aspects or manifestations of God, and that this universe was created by an inferior God as a poor copy of the spiritual world. Were these new ideas? Where did they come from? The Gnostic view of God was not particularly strange in their ancient context. In fact, it was similar to ideas found in other philosophical works of the time that were indebted to Plato. The great philosopher Plato died in the middle of the 300s BC, some 400 years before the Gnostics. But many philosophers, including Jews and Christians, as well as pagans, continued to look to Plato for inspiration. In one of his most popular works, the Timaeus, Plato had described how a god named the Demiurge, or craftsman, created the universe in which we live by making it as a material copy of an ideal spiritual world made up of eternal ideas. The craftsman god makes other lower gods to help him as he makes this world as good a copy of the spiritual world as it can be. You can already see that the Gnostics Yaldabaoth works like Plato's craftsman god by creating his fellow rulers and then making this universe as an imperfect copy of the spiritual entirety. Now, did Plato think that there was a god higher than the craftsman, just as the Gnostics thought that the invisible spirit was a higher god than Yaldabaoth? Plato himself is not very clear on this point, but later reader, readers of Plato agreed that there must be such a higher god. For one thing, the craftsman god in Plato's Timaeus makes this material world as a copy of the spiritual world. So if that's true, who made the spiritual world? Platonist philosophers figured that some higher god must have done so. Moreover, in another of his works, Plato spoke of a god he called the One, who was beyond description and even beyond normal existence. The craftsman god does not seem much like the One. So again, most people concluded that Plato must have taught that there is an ultimate god higher than the craftsman god, whom we don't really know. That god is obviously much like the Gnostics' invisible virgin spirit. As I said, other Jews and Christians also accepted these ideas. For example, Philo was a Jewish philosopher who lived in Alexandria in Egypt in the first century AD. He believed that Plato and the Jewish Bible must have been saying the same thing. The ultimate god, Philo said, is simply being itself and beyond our direct knowledge. This ultimate god did not create the world directly. Rather, he did so through a lower aspect of god, or a divine mediating principle, which Philo called god's word, or in Greek, god's logos. Through the word or logos, god created the world as we read in Genesis. The word created this world, just as Plato said, as a copy of a spiritual world in the mind of god. Philo taught that God has other divine powers as well, such as wisdom. The Gospel of John in the New Testament has similar ideas. It starts out, In the beginning was the Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, that is, through the Word. According to the Gospel of John, it's this Word of God that became human in Jesus Christ, not the ultimate God, the Father. Likewise, Paul, in his letters, calls Christ the wisdom of God. So both the Jewish philosopher Philo and the Christian Gospel of John agreed that it's too simple to say that there's just one God. Rather, there's an ultimate God, the Father, who has divine powers, including wisdom and word. It's one of these divine powers who actually created the universe in which we live. In this context, 
What stands out about the Gnostics is how many aspects and powers they attributed to God. Like Philo, Paul, and the Gospel of John, they have God's word and God's wisdom, but they also have the Barbalo, the self-originate, the four luminaries, and so on. But even more striking is that the craftsman god of the Gnostics is the ignorant and evil Yaldabaoth, not a positive god as in Plato and these other Jews and Christians. Why is it that? And what does it mean? As I suggested in the last lecture, the Gnostics most likely concluded that the creator god of Genesis is not just inferior to the higher god, but also ignorant and malicious for two reasons. First, the god of Genesis at times acts in ways that suggest ignorance and malice. In the Garden of Eden, he asks Adam where he is, and in stories like Noah and the Flood and Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroys numerous people. The Gnostics probably saw these actions as unworthy of a good god. Second, there were tendencies in the Christian tradition to see the Old Testament in a negative light. Paul, you'll remember, contrasted faith in Christ with obedience to the Jewish law. Christians should follow faith, not the law. Consider also the Gospel of John, which spoke of the word of God as the creator of this world. That gospel frequently contrasts Jesus and Moses, putting Moses in a negative light. And in chapter 8 of John, Jesus says to a group of Jews, you are from your father, the devil. So, building on the Platonist philosophy of the time and on Christian ambivalence about the Jewish tradition, the Gnostics concluded that it was the inferior deity Yaldabaoth who created this world, not the pure and perfect invisible spirit. But what about the rest of the creation story in Genesis? How and why did Yaldabaoth create Adam and Eve? If Yaldabaoth is the god of this world, what does this mean for human beings? And what can wisdom do to correct the mistake that led to all this in the first place? In the next lecture, we'll turn to human history and salvation in The Secret Book According to John.